Welcome everyone, I'm the Depressed Eeyore, and this is Argent the Consortium on Tabletop Simulator. Um, I do own the physical copy of this game, um, and the creators of this game have pretty much gave the AOK -okay for um, any, uh, pretty much any digital version of this game, as long as it doesn't include the um, expansions. So that's really cool of them. So this full game is on Tabletop Simulator. Um, only complaints I have about it is the table's way too small. So unless you know how to get a good custom table from probably the workshop or make your own that's a lot bigger, um, you're going to have to kind of get some more room. Um, with things like all these spells and cards, and there's a lot of characters and a lot of things in this game, um, It's uh, there's not enough real estate. Even if you're going with like three players or even two players, you might not have enough space. Um, so that's why I have these little boards that have been flipped over and enlarged just to kind of hold stuff over um, off the main board itself. Um, besides that, um, I think overall it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good mod. Um, as for the game itself, um, Argent the Consortium is a, a worker placement game. Um, pretty much the background is the Chancellor um, of Argent University, which is a magic university, um, is stepping down and all these characters are trying to become the next Chancellor. And the way you become the next Chancellor is by getting the most votes. Um, this game does have points very similar to something like uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Um, I generally like this game quite a bit. Unfortunately, I don't really have very many people to play with. Um, and uh, I've been trying to record a, a session of this, but this game is reasonably complicated to the point where me playing multiple characters is actually very, very strenuous because there's just so much to keep track of. Um, I just did one for two-player, um, but unfortunately I used Fraps, and Fraps ended up being just way too big of a file. Um, so I'm using a different recording software, and since I already did a playthrough uh, just recently, I feel a little bit comfortable doing a, three, a standard three-player game. Playing two, it's generally the game is supposed to be three to five players. Um, there's a two-player variant, and I think there's even a bigger player variant somewhere too, but um, two players are a bit different as far as the setup is concerned. Um, definitely a recommendation though, if you do want to mess around with this mod is, like I said, set up the um, some extra real estate or make a bigger table or something like that. My other recommendation is to make multiple saves of different layouts. Uh, the game has a lot of random randomization as far as like setting up. A lot of, uh, I guess, customization is probably a more appropriate term. Uh, but it does have some pre-set up layouts for three, four, and five players if you don't want to, if you don't want to do random room tiles. Um, so this is for the, I have it set up for the three player, four player, and five player as saves. And if I ever need to, I can always just, um, put the, uh, cards back to, uh, and just shuffle them. So like over here, I have the rest of the, uh, the room tiles. Um, what's kind of neat about the room tiles and a lot of things about this game, besides, I mean, like I said, it's a lot of customization that's available is pretty much everything has an A side and a B side. So there's the adventuring one here, and then there's the one here. And I can just do kind of a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, just completely different. Anyway, um, the other thing is, um, like I said, a, there's A sides and B sides uh, for rooms, as well as characters, and as well as the, um, the agent slash meeples themselves. Um, like I said, this is a worker placement game. Um, I would put it in line kind of similar to um, Lords of Waterdeep, but a lot more advanced and a lot more going on around it. So let's go ahead and just jump right into this. We're going to go over this uh, kind of the, uh, the goal of the game and uh, how standard setup goes. So first of all, like I said before, you have to get the most votes. Um, so up here in the top left, you got the... Um, actually, you know what? We'll just start with the uh, the setup, and we'll kind of explain it as we go. So first things first, we need to set up the player offices. I'm going to be doing a three-player game here. So I'm going to go ahead and use... Um, I'm going to go ahead and use... Each of the characters um, ha are associated with a particular school of magic. There are five schools of magic, and there's also one character that's specifically uh, a neutral and isn't associated with any school of magic. Um, the only benefit, uh, he ends up starting with weaker um, mages, but he does start out with a merit badge, which can give him some kind of unique advantages in the beginning while being disadvantaged in other ways. Um, but I'm not going to be using him. I'm not going to be using the uh, neutral guy, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete him so he doesn't his pieces don't accidentally fall off because they will slide off and end up in the middle. So uh, as for the characters I'm going to be playing with, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take... Now, like I said, there's an A side and B side for everything. So if I were to move these guys out of the way, there's uh, Berman here, Dean of Sorcery. 
And then on the opposite side, you have Ricky uh, Kanahame, head of, the, of Applied Sorcery. They're both um, specialized in the School of Sorcery, so they get Red Mages, which is what I have here, also known as Sorcery Mages. The main difference between the A side and B side, is, besides the character themselves, is um, their spell. So you can either be Berman, who has the Flash of Light spell, which banishes mages, or you can get um, Reki's spell, which is literally she sacrifices her own students for mana. Um, what's kind of neat, the rulebook in the back does have some lore about the characters. Also, all the characters themselves have little quotes that are kind of neat, um, and as, as, as do all the spells. So uh, first things first is we need to set up players. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go... I'm going to go B-side with um, Reki here. Um, pretty much every character, every school of magic except for neutral has a essentially a male or a female character. Um, neutral has nothing but males, unfortunately. Uh, we'll, kept, we'll go with Cal as, the, um, as a divinity. And then over here, we'll get ourselves... Um, we'll do B-side of school of mysticism, which I need to unlock. There we go. And then relock. So her thing is um, A side would have been Trance, which she allows him to get free mana, which is actually pretty neat. Or and then Dark Pack, which is um where he banish she banishes one of her own uh, uh, mages and damages another. Anyway. So like I said, you can already see that they start out with a couple of meeples of a certain color. Um, in Lords of Waterdeep, the meeple colors were based off the player color. In this game, there are multiple different colors, and each player can have any of those in almost any combination. And the way you keep track of them is with these little flag things. So whenever you play someone on the board, you just go, okay, I'm going to put here and put a token with it. And I'll just that's how we're going to keep track of stuff. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and lock that down. That should be good. Okay. Oh. Also, I want to go ahead and turn off hands because we don't need them right now. There is a slight use for hands, but we're not going to worry about it as far as showing it as a, since I'm playing by myself, uh, it's just going to be in the way. Anyway, so that takes care of that. Uh, so we picked the characters. So we're just going to go with these three characters here. Um, each character starts with six. Um, well, first you pick a character, and then you pick a side, which means you pick A side or B side, which I've already done. Um, then you get two mages associated with that department, indicated by your, uh, the card. So you can see the card here. There's Head of Applied Sorcery, so it's Sorcery. And so I have two Sorcery mages. Divinity, so two of Divinity. And then Mysticism, which is two Mysticism. Uh, as far as the, the tokens themselves, they just use Sword Art Online. They actually look kind of good as far as... I don't really care for the anime, but it's still good, pretty neat looking little tokens. Um, so along with the mages, you start out with six gold, which is generally used to buy things. Uh, two mana, which is usually the fuel spells and abilities. Um, two intelligence tokens, which is for research. Uh, and two wisdom, which is also used for research. And then if you happen to be playing the department of students, which is neutral, uh, you would get a merit badge at this point. But none of us, none of these characters are that. Uh, next, you set the consortium board. Consortium board is up here. Um, we need to get the point trackers. So we got these uh, and mysticism. I'm going to do this and then scale it down a bit. They're a little bit big for the slot. Um, all characters start at five, like so. Oh, also the. Uh, while picking characters, you would be figuring out who the first player is. Uh, first player is whoever last attended a university class. For me, it's probably been about three or four years. Um, it's, it specifically says attend a class in university, so it, does, it doesn't count if you work there or just you know, go there for whatever reason. Um, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to make the first player be... Um, we'll make it Ricky for right now, since she's furthest to the left and I'm left-handed. Anyway, back to setting up the consortium board. This is the consortium board. Uh, it has a point tracker, which is, in this game, points are known as influence. Uh, all characters start at five. You might also notice that there are little shields uh, along the track. Anytime that you uh, land on or pass one of those shields, you will get them. Um, those shields are merit tokens, um, or merit badges, sorry. Um, that's one of the things that the, uh, the neutral 
character gets to start with automatically. Uh, merit badges can be used to get uh, activate certain uh, locations that are a little bit more advanced in, in all the rooms. Um, we'll talk about rooms in a second. Um, besides that, um, stack these markers. Stack these markers in clockwise turn order. Starting from the last player. Yeah, so that... Oh, so I have it backwards, actually. It should be like this. There you go. So that's the order. It's based off player order. So you start with the last player, putting it down, then the next player, and then the first player. So the first player should be on top, and it should go down in order. Anyway, um, now there are our voter cards, and we need to put the two with white borders onto the board, which they, I already have. Uh, this one is most influence. Uh, this is the chancellor himself, that the guy that the guy that is stepping down. And then there is um, the dean of students, who who is uh, most supporters. So at this point, let's talk about the victory condition for this game. So unlike Lords of Waterdeep, which is just most points, in this game it's most votes. Now influence will, and in, so you might notice that one of the cards, one of the voters, is most influence. So if you have the most points in this little tracker here you'll get his vote, but that alone will not get you to victory. Um, for example, most diversity. So the rest of these cards are actually going to be face down. Um, so the only ones that are faced up is most influence and most supporters. So whoever has the most influence will get a vote, and whoever has the most supporter cards, which supporter cards are these cards over here. Um, it, for the requirements, it, it will count anything that you have in your in your possession or in your personal discard pile. So in this case, to show one of the other ones that you can get, there's most diversity. This one you get the you will get this person's vote if you have the most variety of supporter and spell research. So for example, if you had um, this uh, this heal spell and this spell shield spell, uh, you would only get it will only count towards uh, one towards most diversity. But if you happen to have Heal and Inner Fire, which are two different schools of magic, that would be count as, as two towards this vote. And then, of course, there are different colors of supporters. So the most that you can get for most diversity is supposedly 10 towards it, in which case you have one of every type of school of magic and one of every type of supporter. And if you happen to get the highest uh, at the end of the game, you get her vote. And if you get the most votes, you win. Now, if there's ever a tie, that's when influence also matters, because whoever has the highest influence will, will be the tiebreaker. Now, you will not know what most of these vo voters are unless you make an effort to find out. Um, in the beginning of the game, um, each character will have a mark that they can put on one of these cards, and only, um, only people, uh, cards can only be seen by people that have a mark on it. And they have to. They will be seen privately. Um, technically, you can say what it is out loud, but that's. I personally, I find that to be kind of poor sport. But so anyway, to set up this board, you get the two ones that you have to get. You set up the the tokens on, on number five for influence, and then you just shuffle the voters and put them face down. That's all you do. All right. Next, we prepared the university. Now this is where the, you get the board itself. So in Lords of Waterdeep, you had a pre-made board with a bunch of locations that you just put meeples on. In this one, um, there are like a, there are pre-generated setups for three, four, and five players, uh, but you can also play it in a way uh, where you can just take turns uh, placing um, placing rooms down. Uh, the only requirements are you have to have all three of the white bordered rooms. So you have to have the council chamber, library, and infirmary. Uh, but besides that, you can either pick or uh, randomly grab a bunch of room tiles. And as long as you have them connected in some form or fashion, uh, it's a legit setup. Uh, in the case of the pre-generated stuff, it's just going to set up in rows, a standard kind of rectangle or square shapes, which is fine. Uh, adjacency does matter as far as certain spells are concerned. It also matters um, as far as like what order the rooms are in, uh, because you, when you resolve rooms, you go from left uh, top to bottom, left to right. Or sorry, left to right, top to bottom, that order. So you go left to right, the next row. So row by row. Anyway, so I already have this all set up. Um, there is an A side and a B side for all these uh, locations, and each of these um, each of these rooms have their own little location. Sorry, I keep calling them locations. Each of these rooms 
even though some of them aren't technically rooms, um, have a bunch of locations that you can put people in. Um, speaking of, anything that the blank slots, you can just put a character here just normally. Uh, the ghost slots uh, can only be put in if you're doing something known as shadowing, which is a certain spell or ability that you can, that essentially you shadow, you, you're essentially some, in someone else's shadow, um, which gives you the ability to essentially occupy the same location they are. Um, and then there's those locations that have the little shield on them. Um, those are merit slots. And when you're in those slots, uh, when it comes to resolving them, you have to spend a merit, a merit badge to get the benefit, else it, you, will de it, you won't get it. Um, now, something that's kind of unique in this game is, unlike uh, Lords of Waterdeep, where you just place someone down and you get the benefit, um, unless it's a, uh, a fast a fast location or a, um, a uh, what's it called? I'm just trying to use the proper, I'm trying to use the proper turn here. If it's an immediate Aaron, it will, you can get it immediately. And if it's something like the infirmary, which is known as a sympathy bonus, uh, you will get that effect immediately. But everything else... Um, when you place the characters in those locations, they don't you don't get the benefit until the end of the round. Only when the end of the round happens do, do you get the um, the benefit. So that's kind of where the game gets a little bit more chaotic. In Lords of Waterdeep and other placement games, uh, usually the only way you interact with other players is with certain maybe special cards, and then the primary way is just literally to place a, a, a meeple before they do and block them. In this game, you can block people, but they could move you they can banish you they can wound you you can shadow them um it's there's a lot of kind of crazy variety in this game um and there are tons of spells and abilities and supporters and even the agents even the little agents you put your uh, by your uh, by themselves all have their own unique abilities um that can just really change the 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 scape of the, the landscape of the game anyway so for this I think I pretty much kind of explained everything here. Um, the infirmary is kind of the only special location at this point um, because it, you you don't really voluntarily go there. You can only go there if you get wounded, and when you're wounded there, you can't really leave unless you get healed or banished. So usually you go to the infirmary because someone beat the crap out of you, and then you just get the sympathy bonus of your choice. Um, anyway, so as far as the locations themselves, uh, we'll kind of go into them a little bit later once we actually start playing. Uh, we're still doing the setup here, so place pa mage power cards. Um, so mage power cards are just really to keep track of if you don't know what the, uh, the different agents do. Now, just like in other things in this game, there's an A side and B side. So if you find yourself find the group really kind of favors a certain type of ma mage color, uh, you can always just flip the card and see if they if it changes the, the game a bit more. But I'm going to go ahead and stick with A side for everything for right now. So there are blue mages, which is divinity. Uh, their special ability is they're immune to all opponent spells. So allied spells still help them, but um, no one can any spells that are targeted uh, that are used against them, even if they're area, area effect, um, won't protect them. Um, in fact, even spells that supposedly remove. Um, a mage's special ability doesn't even work against divinity. They're just magic is null against them. Sorcery. Uh, their gimmick is you can spend one mana to wound a, a mage on the board and then replace that mage with yours. Or sorry, replace that sl that that net, that now empty slot with with the with the sorcery mage. So essentially, they go around punching people. You know, they just they they they're muscle mages. They cast they cast fist. They punch someone off that point. Send them to the infirmary and take it over. Mysticism. Uh, they are the black mages. Uh, they their special ability is anytime you cast a spell that as a action, which some spells are actions, some are not. Um, you will after you resolve any reactions, if there are any, you can place a mystic mage for free. So you can literally be like, okay, I cast fireball and wound somebody, and then after that, I place a mage. A uh, uh, mysticism mage. So they're pretty neat if you're someone that likes to really ca do a lot of spell slinging. Uh, natural magic. These are green. Their, their gimmick is they're immune to wounding. So sorcery mages cannot punch these guys. They are unpunchable, and even magic spells that do wounding will not hurt them. So they're kind of like divinity, but they're specifically immune to damage. Uh, speaking of, uh, divinity mages may be immune to magic, but they're not immune to punching. Um, and then the final one is Planner Studies, which is purple. Their, their gimmick, in the, at least for the A side, is they can be placed as a fast action rather than a regular action. 
Uh, we'll talk more about fast actions and regular actions uh, when we actually start playing. So that's our kind of, so five different agent types. There's also a sixth type, which is neutral. Uh, neutrals have no special abilities whatsoever. They're just, they just can be placed. So they can run errands, but they can't really help in any other ways. All right, uh, so that's the major power cards. Next is we set up the bell tower. So there are five bell tower cards. Um, each of them have a label in the bottom. Like if you see underneath the title bar to the uh, to the right corner there, uh, there's a five plus. Uh, that's how many players have to be participating in order for you to uh, in order if if you're going to add it to the game. So there's the two plus here, two plus here, and a three plus here. We're playing a three player game, so these are the three cards we have. Um, at any t um, during your turn, you can grab one of these cards, and that'll pretty much end your turn. Uh, some of them give you the first action for the next round, some of them just give you points, and some just give you some gold and mana. And then there's a few extra ones back here. Anyway, uh, so that's the bell tower. So we have that set up. Um, so actually, I guess I'll explain a little bit about the bell tower. Um, so just using Lords of Waterdeep as an example, uh, a lot of times Lords of Water the way rounds end in, in, uh, in Lords of Waterdeep was when everyone finished putting down their agents. In this game, uh, the round ends the moment someone uh, once all the bell tower cards have been taken. Doesn't matter who takes them. It's just if once that last card is picked up, um, that ends the round. Doesn't matter if you still have uh, agents to place. Doesn't matter if you have spells to cast or items to use. Round ends and a new round will start. Speaking of, we need to set up the round cards. Um, a standard game is five rounds, but you can also do six rounds if you really feel like it. We're going to do five rounds. All right. Steps seven, eight, and nine is create decks and tableaus. So we're going to set, uh, here's the, there's a spell deck, supporter deck, and a vault deck. Spells are spells, essentially. The way spells work is when you research them, you can learn the spell. And that spell will have essentially three different spells attached to it. And you can kind of do research um, to learn those spells. And whenever you have a, a spell research, um, you can cast it if you, do the appropriate action and spend the mana. And whenever you cast a spell, it will exhaust the entire spell. So even if, like, for example, if you had Inner Fire and Kindle, and you choose to cast Inner Fire, you will not be able to cast Kindle because it'll be exhausted. Uh, there are ways to unexhaust cards um, or restore cards, and um, but we'll get more into that if it ever comes up. So we're just going to put three card uh, spells up here. Anytime a spell is uh, researched and taken from this, um, a new card will be will replace it immediately. Also, at the end of the round, these cards will be discarded to the bottom of the deck, and three more will be play, um, dealt. Supporters, uh, their gimmick is they're all just like magic. They are associated to a school of magic, and they all have just different abilities. Some are actions, some are fast actions, and they kind of do a variety of things. Get you research, get you additional um, uh, mages to kind of place. Um, all sorts of fancy stuff. Uh, when you use a supporter, they get discarded into your personal uh, discard pile, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, anything that's in your personal discard pile will still count towards uh, votes. Pretty much the main way to get supporters is by drafting them, um, which there's certain locations that allow you to draft them. Um, if you Draft, if any any time a supporter has been drafted from the, the tableau here, um, they will get uh, immediately replaced. And then at the end of the round, they get discarded and five more will be dealt. Uh, then we got treasures, or sorry, uh, vault cards. Uh, there are two types of vault cards. There are treasures and consumables. Uh, generally, consumables are just one use, and once you use them, they get discarded. Uh, into your personal discard pile, as always. Uh, tr Treasures usually stay around, and you can just reuse them over and over again. There's some t there's a few exceptions here and there. Um, and then, essentially, these items kind of do a variety of effects. Like, the Invisibility Cloak will help you protect you against attacks and being hit with spells and all that good stuff. Um, or you can just get something that gives you points. Um, just like spells, these get exhausted whenever you use them, and they get refreshed at the, end, uh, at the start of the next round. Um, consumable items, when you use them, they will just get uh, discarded into your discard pile. So we got those three cards set up, and that is it for those. Next is draft mages. So we start out with two mages uh, based off our school. So 
Red starts with two red uh, sorcery. Divinity starts with two divinity, and mysticism starts with two mysticism. Uh, starting with the last player, and then going counterclockwise. Let's see. Place all mages in the center of the table. So yeah, starting with the last player. The last player is, if we're going clockwise, it would actually be the last player would actually be Cal. All right. So starting with Cal, she uh, any remaining mages would be put in a pile, and they would just grab whatever they want. So technically, these ones that are up here uh, could be taken. There is a finite number of certain colors. Um, there's also one other restriction. Um, with uh, even uh, no matter what cannot have more than two of a certain type. So we cannot actually grab an additional divinity mage. Uh, what she's going to grab, though, is she's going to grab a natural mage because she wants to be really, really defensive. Um, so that was going counterclockwise. So starting from uh, the last person, it's going to go to uh, Jessica here. Uh, Jessica is going to grab herself a planner mage. Okay, next it's going to be uh, Reki. Uh, Reki is going to go ahead and grab herself a mysticism mage. All right, and then then you go from the first player and then go clockwise. So it's it's now Reki's turn again. She's going to go ahead and take a natural mage. Actually, she's not going to take a natural mage. She's going to take a divinity mage. Ooh, do I want a divinity mage? I'm going to take a I'm going to take a planner mage. All right, and then it's going to go to Jessica, and Jessica is going to go ahead and take a natural mage herself. Okay, then it's going to go to Cal. Cal's going to go ahead and take a mysticism mage for uh, herself, and then it's going to go back around the other way. Um, once again, starting from the last player. So just uh, uh, Cal's going to go ahead and take a planner mage. I believe her name's Ray, but I'm going to be calling her last name. Uh, Jessica is actually going to go ahead and grab... Yeah, she's going to go ahead and grab a planner mage. So now she has two. And then uh, Ricky here is actually going to go ahead and grab herself a Divinity Mage, like so. Okay, and that should be it. So everyone should have five mages, and these will pretty much be with us for the entire game. Uh, there's some ways to replace them, but we don't have that in this board. All right, uh, next is staying, putting the uh, starting marks. So every character starts with a, sort, a mark. A mark allows, is placed on top of these uh, voter cards, and like I mentioned before, anyone that has a mark on that card can look at that card. Now, there's a slight, uh, now just something that's just an easy way to do it for Tabletop Simulator. Just make copies of their cards, and then put them in your hand. So only these players, um, now there is one restriction for placing marks. Um, in the beginning of the game, uh, you cannot put the same mark. Uh, you can't put a mark on the same card as someone else's. Um, now, throughout the game, you can that rule doesn't apply. But in the beginning, they have to be on different cards. So no matter what, each player is going to know about one voter and be able to do something about it. Uh, here, this is what we're going to do. So what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of I'm just doing this so I don't have to rotate. I'll put you down here. There you go, like so. Okay, and you can hang out there. That's fine. Okay, so let's talk. Uh, so let's figure out what votes are around. So we already knew about the uh, most influence and most supporters. Uh, Reki here knows that one of the voters is interested in mysticism. So whoever has the most spell research into mysticism and supporter cards. And 
just to read the name. That is the legendary. Uh, that is uh, the legendary healer. Um, the Senate Majority Whip is interested in natural magic. So any uh, total of natural magic spell research and supporter cards. And then the last one is Overlord of Gesselheim, who's interested in the player who has the most marks placed. So right now it's a tie. So for the most part, everything's a tie at the at the beginning, and anyone that uh, has the most influence will be the uh, most influence will be the tiebreaker in most cases. All right. So with that, we're ready to start the first round of, uh, first round of the game. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it a video here, and when we come back, we will start playing. <laughs> 